mind-boggling. He, he came up with the best narcissistic statement I think that's ever been written. And, and this is what he was like, because he, he was a very sick man and he could only write for very short periods of time, so he tried to cram everything he could into a single sentence. And so each sentence is like a little bomb. But one of his, now and then he'd write, you know, something self-referential. So one phrase of his is, I write more in his, I write in a sentence what other people write in a book. That's pretty good, eh? That's a good brag. But then he topped it right away after. He said, ah, what other people can't even write in a book. Yeah, so that's pretty good. Like, narcissism in that, like, he just punched through that. He wasn't there. Yeah, so, but it's true. Like, that's the thing, it's true. So it wasn't narcissism. I mean, for anyone else, it would have been. For him, it was just true. So, yeah, yeah. So, back to you. Nietzsche sort of hypothesized that in order for people to overcome the psychological consequences of the destruction of their religious underpinnings, they would have to transform themselves into, virtually into the thing that they had killed. So Nietzsche's, and this was, believe me, for Nietzsche, this was like a revelatory solution. He came up with this in a book called Thus Spake Zarathustra. Now everybody who reads Nietzsche starts to read Thus Spake Zarathustra because it's got such a cool title, you know, but you shouldn't read that book, you, at least not until you've read, say, Beyond Good and Evil and other books that he wrote, because Thus Spake Zarathustra is a weird book. It's like an Old Testament revelation, and it really is. It's like, it's a fantasy. This man comes down from the mountain and starts to spout off, like, poetic revelations. And Nietzsche's, the rest of Nietzsche's books are, like, this very, very clear and cutting thought, whereas this one is like a, it's like a Shakespearean drama, almost. And the reason for that is because Nietzsche was reaching beyond the grip of his intellect to try to formulate answers to questions that he could not, he could not grasp because what he was trying to figure out is, well, as human beings have developed cognitively, in some sense, we've escaped from our culture and our instincts. And when we're embedded in our culture and our instincts, we're embedded unconsciously within a religious framework. It's the framework of presuppositions from which we emerged. Like, people didn't think up religions. What do you, there's some little, weird little, what we call conspiracy going on for 3,000 years? It's like, no, it's not about power. Even though it can be twisted to be about power, everything can be, or twisted to be about economics. It's about fantasy. You know, the, 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 all, the, you look inside a European cathedral, all you see is fantasy. It's in, it's in brilliant lights portrayed everywhere. It's trying to say something to you. Well, what's it trying to say? Well, it turned out when people asked themselves that, instead of just acting it out, they hadn't got a clue what it said. They had no idea what it said. Any more than you guys know why you have Christmas trees. So how many of you have Christmas trees? Yeah, why? Oh, well, I don't know. I never noticed we had Christmas trees, you know. No, but my point is, my point is that in a culture, you can follow, you follow the customs because that's what you do. And, but then when you wake up a bit and think, well, you're just like a Piagetian child who is taken out of the game and forced to look at it. It's like, well, why are you playing that game and what are the rules? Well, I never thought about it before. Well, as soon as people started to think about the games they were playing, it was often because they encountered other people who thought, apparently thought differently, you know? So if you're like a marauding Christian and you go into the East and all of a sudden you come up with a Buddhist and, He's smart. It's like you two have big problems, right? Because you're smart and he's smart and you don't think the same way, at least apparently, you don't think the same way at all. So even if you say, well, those Buddhists, you know, we should just wipe them out. It doesn't matter because their thoughts are already there and they've been working on them for like a couple of thousand years. And whether you like it or not, they're going to make you think. And once you start thinking about your religion, you're in trouble. And so that's the situation we're in right now. So Jung took this problem that Nietzsche had posed seriously because Jung was caught up quite dramatically in the events of, of, of Nazi Germany. Now, you know, when we think about Nazi Germany, we think, of course, that it was perfectly obvious that the Nazis were the, were the perpetrators and that, you know, everyone else was the victim. And that if we were there, we would have clearly seen that and we wouldn't have been Nazis. And it's like, that's not true. That isn't how it worked because these things happen slowly. They sort of happen piece by piece. You know, we started seeing a similar thing happen, I think, 
after the after the Twin Towers fell in New York, you know, it's like people gave up five, ten percent of their civil liberties in, in like a, a month. You know, and 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 it was okay. It was like it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. And it just shows you how easy that sort of thing can, can start. You know, the Germans were under tremendous stress in the 1930s. Their whole economy blew out. They had to like take wheelbarrows full of billions of marks to buy a piece of bread. Their currency fell to zero. Unemployment was staggeringly high. They were paying off debts like mad because of the First World War. And there was a real threat that the communists were going to start a revolution. It's like, you don't have problems like that. So the, the, the Germans had no idea what to do, you know, and, and Hitler was a, a canny, canny person with a brilliant, brilliant sense of drama. I mean, he was a real he was a master of dark fire, that guy. And I think his, his unconscious fantasy was, let's see how much we can destroy before we die in the, in the what, purifying flames. That was Hitler. So, and he was, he, he was a compelling person. And the fantasy that he had in the back of his mind, I'll tell you how that developed at one point. It was a very hard thing to escape from. And that's why the Germans became Nazis. It wasn't like, this was like magic that had emerged. And it was black magic. So Jung was very interested in this because he was in the Germanic speaking areas of the world when this happened. And he felt, felt himself pulled very strongly by what the Nazis were doing, especially in the early stages of the development of the political platform, because things did stabilize, you know, and then they stabilized before they went completely out of control. And of course, looking in retrospect, you can see the seeds of what eventually transpired to become such a catastrophe. But at the time, it was by no means self-evident that such a thing was going to occur, especially given all the other horrible things that were likely to occur. So Jung had a, had a vision at one point in, on a train, I think it was in Switzerland, that Europe had become so covered with blood that the blood was starting to flow over the mountains into Switzerland, because of course Switzerland is neutral. And he said it was one of the most horrifying nightmares of his life. And this was in, I think, 1930. It was late, late 1930s, anyway. So it was a premonition of war. And he spent a lot of time trying to understand, well, if you weren't going to become a fascist and worship the state, and you weren't going to become a nihilist and worship nothing, <coughs> what in the world were you going to do exactly to orient yourself? And how would you protect yourself against the attractions of blind state identification, for example, or the attractions of nihilism. You know, you might say, well, nihilism has no attraction at all because it says to you, everything is irrelevant, nothing you do has any importance, because that's nihilistic, basically. Well, what's the, what's the, the psychoanalyst would say, what's the secondary gain from that? Like, yeah, you say that's what you believe, and maybe you even act it out. And you also say, well, you've come to that conclusion through, you know, a rational process of deliberation. But the psychoanalyst would say, it's kind of convenient that that also alleviates you of all responsibility, isn't it? And it kind of sheds a little dampness on your claim to pristine cognition as the driving force between, you know, behind your adoption of that theory. You know, it's like, it's like the patriot who claims that, you know, the reason that he's kicking someone in the head is because he's patriotic. It's like, no, no, no. You're patriotic so that you can kick someone in the head and still look at yourself in the mirror in the morning has nothing to do with rational deliberation. And so the psychoanalysts, and Jung was like this in particular, you know, they were always extremely skeptical about people's rational claims about their commitments to ideology, and rightly so. One of the things Jung said that I love, he said some things that were so brilliant, was that people didn't have ideas. Ideas had people. And when you think that I, see, it's like, it's like I think this is so funny, it's like Dawkins' idea of the meme. You know, some of you, how many of you read Dawkins? He's, you know, yeah, okay, so Dawkins has this idea of meme. It's so funny to read Dawkins because he's like 20% of the way to being in union without even knowing it. And so he's produced this idea called meme, which is these they're ideas. A meme is an idea that sort of has an independent existence in a sense because it can infect different minds or move from mind to mind. And he kind of thinks of it more like a fad. Well, the archetypes are memes. Except they're no fads. They're memes that have lasted for like 20,000 years, or maybe 20 million years. We have no idea how old they are. And Jung got where Dawkins was going, like, you know, 50 years before and 200 stories deeper. 
So it's so funny to read Dawkins because what he is searching for has already been figured out by Jung, but he's so prejudiced against any kind of religious thinking that there's no...